so much for staying with us right here on Women Radio WFM 91.7. I hope that your day is going on well. This is nine minutes after 12, right here on Women Radio WFM 91.7. All right, so well, this is um, the first responder story right here where we get to look at um, different organizations and, of course, uh, taking their experiences so far as first responders of uh, survivors of gender-based violence. All right, so today is day 12 of the 16 days of activism with the theme Unite and First to Prevent Violence Against Women and Girls. The 16 Days of Activism is a global campaign which started off on the 25th of November at uh, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women up until the 10th of December uh, Human Rights Day. Now this year, Women Radio 91.7 is spotlight and first responders who provide first-hand help and support the survivors of gender-based violence. All right, so um, today with us as a first responder is Titi Lola Vivod Adeniyi. She's the Executive Secretary of Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency. So I'm sure that for those who live around here, you're very familiar with this agency and, uh, you know, the work that uh, Titi Lola has been doing through this agency. Now, even we here at uh, with Women Radio have actually had, you know, a course to give out the numbers of this agency and try to see how help can come to um, a lot of women who are going through sexual and domestic violence. All right, so um, today we have uh, Titi Lola uh, Vivo Adeniyi, and of course she's going to be telling us uh, the first responder story as an agency here in Lagos. All right, so to be a part of the program, you can dial the number 0700-917-917. Send us a text or a WhatsApp message to 0703175637. All right, so you can follow us on all our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, X and of course YouTube at WFM nine one seven. Log on to our website www.wfm nine one seven dot com. So let's head on straight to hear um, a first responder story from uh, Titilola today. Uh, work done so far, successes, challenges, and way forward in ending violence against women and girls. All right. So, um, Titi, you're welcome to the program. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Good us afternoon. today. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So, um, let's go now. Now, as an agency, how have you been responding to gender-based violence so far, especially, you know, uh, around this axis, Lagos? Yes. Um, again, thank you so much for having me. In Lagos State, we view this from a multidisciplinary lens. Uh, we know that these issues are, there are a lot of intersectionalities, there are a lot of cross-cutting, um, intertwined issues. And so we view this since 2014 when we were a response team. Hmm. We look at this from an issue that requires a multidisciplinary approach, knowing that there's no one organization that can provide all the services that survivors of sexual and gender-based violence require. So obviously we approach this from as I said, the multidisciplinary lens, medical, legal, psychosocial support, counseling. Sometimes some survivors have to be rescued from perilous situations. Um, access to justice. We're talking about crime, criminal allegations, and the crime is committed against the state. So it's important for, you know, the survivors to access justice. And it's also important for the state to ensure the perpetrators are held accountable. And so we do this leveraging um, leveraging partnership collaboration among relevant stakeholders, be it governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations, provide you know holistic support to survivors. So that's in terms of response. But we know we have a higher calling hmm. to, to which is geared at prevention. Right? We know that the um, jury is still out on whether or not you can truly prevent these cases from happening. But what we know is that we may not be able to prevent entirely because we do not know of any jurisdiction that can say they can boast of zero HGBV in their respective states. Hmm. But I know that we can put measures in place to reduce the chances or the likelihood of it occurring. And so that's where the, the angle of prevention comes in. Behavioral mindset and programs 
um, ensuring we have community engagement, door-to-door engagement with the citizens and the residents of Lagos State. So that's what we try to do. We try to heighten awareness about this issue because we know these issues thrive in secrecy. But when people start to become more aware of the issues, become more aware of support services that exist, become more aware of the institutions they can go to to take advantage of, we believe that that will also serve as a means of prevention. So those are the two ways, the two-pronged approach we have used in addressing this vicious menace. Hmm, okay, thank you so much, Iti, for that. Now, um, thank you for telling us how far, you know, you have gone in responding to violence so far, especially in Lagos. Now, let's hear your experience. You know, what has it been like dealing with survivors themselves of gender-based violence? What are some of the common perception and facts about, you know, dealing with survivors of gender-based violence so far? Okay, so I think it's been a very, <laughs> it's been a very, um, Fulfilling portfolio. I, I won't say it's a job, right? Uh, I think it's it, it's a okay. Maybe portfolio is to be read, but I mean it's been a very fulfilling um, assignment, right? Because we are in a privileged position to somewhat save life. The truth is that you know we are literally dealing with life and death scenarios. The wrong mistake or rather the mistake or the wrong decision hmm. can have great impact on not just the person experiencing the violence, but on the family as a unit, you know, on the whole, on, uh, as a total complete unit, including children. So it, it, it has been a great opportunity, one that I will forever be um, grateful to the governor of Lagos State, Governor Bada Jigitongu, for, you know, not just appointing me as the executive secretary, but establishing a statutory agency that is devoted to addressing this menace and preventing preventing it as well. Mm. I think by virtue of the work that we do, there's no you cannot predict your day. Because these cases, right, we have some common indicators, but for every case there's always a different element. When you think you've seen it all or heard it all, you see something else that you're, you're just thrown away, right? And then it, the, 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 the assignment has helped us to appreciate little mercy. Little mercy in the sense that the little things that we may take for granted, but when you hear the stories of what some people are going through, you start to appreciate little mercy. A little mercy, for instance, can be having confidence of faith in, in your husband that you can leave your child in the care of your husband without thinking twice. Some people don't have that that confidence because they, they, they either they know that their husband is sexually abusing their child mm. or they suspect. Imagine living in that kind of environment where you, you're telling your daughter to wear um, jeans, wear shorts, double up in terms of what they wear because she's going to bed and she doesn't know if her dad will come into the to the room in the middle of the night to try and, you know, this exposes our mind to the hardship that some, some, some people are experiencing. It also obviously shows us that we have a long way to go. When you, when you, when you hear what some people think, or rather how some people think, their perception to these issues, sometimes you go on the streets, you are campaigning, and you hear people say things like, ah, People are not serious. They are talking about domestic violence. Is that what the government should be talking about? <laughs> because they don't feel mm. that these issues are germane and they don't feel that they, these issues require the needed attention. Because they don't understand the ripple effect that sexual and gender violence has on the community. You know, this is not just a women's issue. I, every time I have the privilege of speaking, I say it's a public health concern. It's an issue. It's, it's, it's a security concern. It's an access to justice problem that has great impact on our economy. So when we start to look at these issues from this multidisciplinary lens, yeah. you know, it now starts to change the way society perceives this issue. The truth is, we are the world with mindset. People, we are all a product of um, socialization. 
social construct, what we've been exposed to, right? And if we are going to change the narrative, we have to work on the mind of, of people. Hmm. If you're scrolling social, if you're on social media, and maybe a case is reported, just check the comments. Check the comments. Check the mentions. Check the messages that will come after that that report. You will be amazed with the way some people think. They get things like, "Oh, for she to what was she expected? We are paid for this, paid for that. Is it that Christmas? Is it Santa Claus? Oh, okay. This 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 case doesn't make sense." It's not supposed to make sense. Domestic violence, sexual violence, incest, having sexual intercourse with your child, having sexual intercourse with your child, having sexual intercourse with the person without their consent, it's not supposed to make sense. And so it just, yeah, it just helps us see that, yes, progress has been made. Are we where we are supposed to be? No. Are we where we used to be? No. But we know that we have, we, we, we are making progress. The will of justice is turning. It may not be turning as fast as all of us want. But the point is, we are making progress. Okay. In changing that narrative, mm. holding perpetrators accountable, mm -hmm. shifting the spotlight from the survivor on to the perpetrator who must be held accountable for him or her action. Hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Titi, for giving us all of that. In fact, you just went ahead to mention some challenges there and how you've been able to overcome some of these challenges. Well, uh, this is Women Radio WFM 91.7, and this is the first responder story right here for the 16 days of activism. Today is day 12, and we have the Executive Secretary of Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency, Titi Lola Vivo Adeniye, and she has told us, you know, some how the organization has been responding so far and her experience so far, including challenges that can be overwhelming. All right, now let's look at um, how the agency. Or okay, well, you can do what to dial the number oh seven thousand nine one seven nine one seven. Send us a text or a WhatsApp message on oh seven zero three one seven five six five three seven. All right, now as an agency, you know, in Lagos, how have you been able to collaborate with security agencies and other responders, you know, and stakeholders to to provide support for gender based violence? How has the um, the collaboration been so far? Thank you. Um, so we know that um, the police, in perhaps maybe 40-50% of the time, mm. will serve as the first responders. And we also know that because they serve as first responders, they are very critical in either encouraging or discouraging survivors from accessing justice and staying through the criminal justice process. And so because we know this, and also, don't forget that we're dealing with criminalization. And it's the constitutional role of the police to investigate cases, right? Mm. So we work very, very closely with the police. And it's not just saying we work closely with the police. Over the years, we have realized that it's important to have, you know, designated, specialized units in the police formation that would address these issues. And when we, when we came on, on the scene, and we have three family support units um, established in partnership with um, Justice for All and the Labour State Government and the Police Command, you know, to have these designated police stations where survivors can report, be treated with empathy, mm -hmm. professionalism, the referral pathway will be activated, and there is that nexus between the police and the government. And so when we came on board, we realized that three wasn't sufficient. And over the years, with the support of the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the Commissioner of Police, we have increased that number to 22 um, family support units spread across the, 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 the state. Now, we know that there is no institution that can boast of perfection. But we also know that this family support unit, hmm. because of the training, because of the interaction, because of the, the partnership, and the, I would even say, friendship that exists between us and the family support unit, we are enjoying and seeing contraction, in, and especially in the way, you know, cases are investigated. Hmm. 
the way the personnel speak with the survivors. As I said, mm. during the first protocol, their, their comments, their body language, their utterances will go a long way in, in reassuring the survivors mm. that they are doing the right thing by breaking the course of silence by speaking up and speaking up. So to answer the question directly, yeah. we appreciate the huge role that the police play in this in this in this in this space. Mm. And we work with them. We build capacity, have regular training, build capacity of the police personnel, assist in formulating SOPs to guide their operations and even provide financial support for investigation. Because again, it's important to note that cases are not one in court. Cases are one at investigation stage. Mm. And so if we do the need for doing investigation stage, every other person will just build on the solid foundation the police has established. Mm. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Titi, uh, for giving us how, you know, you have been collaborating with security agencies. Um, now, let's hear your recommendations for, you know, the, the following, uh, I, I, I love to call them stakeholders, because at the end of the day, it's all of us that come together to help fight this war on, you know, on gender-based violence. So let's hear your recommendations on the government, the society, religious leaders, parents, and women and girls. So I'm actually glad that you are coming, you know, you're coming from an agency where it's the government that is actually putting this up. So, you know, to an extent, um, it's 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 something that we know that, okay, yes, the government is aware about and the government is doing something on, of which we commend that every other state should have something like this, if they don't already have. Now, um, but... For future purpose, by this time next year, what would you want to see the government do more, you know, uh, as regards to survivors of gender-based violence and even cases of gender-based violence and the society too? What would you want to see? What are recommendations for them, religious leaders, parents, and then women and girls? Okay. Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't get you. The last point you made, you said government, society, religious institutions, and who? Uh, parents, and then women and girls. Parents. Women and girls. Okay. Yeah. So, like government, we must all be alive. We must be alive to our, our responsibilities. Mm. This is one way of us um, fulfilling our social contract with the people we live. And I believe that a lot has been done, but a lot remains to be done. And so I believe that we're on the right track with political will. You know, when there's political will, nothing is impossible. And permit me to acknowledge the governor of the state again mm. for demonstrating the requisite political will in addressing this many. And I think that's what helps us to stand for in the country because we have the political will to address the vicious many. And so with that, we maximize it, scale up our interventions, institutionalize the different reforms, and just keep the momentum. I think as another area that we're looking at hopefully this time next day, is that we'll have heightened awareness. Hmm. A lot of people are, 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 are dying in silence. A lot of people still remain unaware of services that exist, right? Yeah. So it's important for us to keep that, moment, that momentum, heighten that awareness, you know, and ensure that irrespective of where you are, hmm. as far as we are a resident of legal state, you have access to the toll free line, you have access to information, you know, support services that exist even within your community. And of course, government has a role to play in ensuring perpetrator accountability, right? One of the greatest deterrents, especially for sexual violence, is conviction. When people see that, you know, you do the crime, you do the time, it sends a message. It's not business as usual. You will be brought to book, and that will help in serving as a deterrent. Hmm. Society plays a huge role. God cannot do it on its own. Yeah. We must offer ourselves as mandated reporters. I loved your intro, the um, jingle that was aired before I came. Hmm. If you see something, say something, do something. We can't wait. We can't keep shifting the blame. Oh, it's the role of government. It's the role of the mosque. It's the role of the church. We all, we are governments. We all have a role to play. 
And it cannot be when it suits us that we become activists. It cannot be when it's all, when it's, it's all, it only suits us rather that we are activists. If we know people that are participating in violence, we must call them out. They must be held accountable. I, I said it earlier on. We have a rape culture, a culture that unifies, a culture that discriminates against the Bible. We cannot continue like this. We often, let's not think that this is peculiar to a particular set of people. This has shown that sexual and gender based violence is not a respecter of free class or creed. Anybody, unfortunately, it's not a cause, but anybody can be a victim of survival of sexual and gender based violence. So let's not wait as societies until it happens to us before we take a stand. We must all take a stand for survival and ensure that the people are held accountable. Hmm. Religion plays a huge role. We are, most of us are religious people. We are in yeah. a religious, in a secular state, right? But we are also very religious. And so the religion, religious institutions play a huge role in either encouraging the perpetration of gender-based violence or discouraging it. And that's what we're doing. That's why we're engaging religious clerics. We are not, we are not usurping their authority. So we are letting them know why these issues must be handled professionally. You can't, as a cleric, you can't be mediating in a family matter every month. Mm. There comes a time when you must have interface with government. Because the truth is, every domestic violence case is a potential murder case. Mm. Right? So, as a religious institution, as a religious cleric, what is your, what is this? The extent of your intervention, and when must you have interface? All right, Titi, our time is up, so I'll just give you a minute to just wrap this up, please. And um, thank you, thank you for mm. the opportunity. I think it's just a call to action. Mm. Okay. In the 16 days of activism and beyond, let us mm. all amplify our voices against this many. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Titi Lola, for coming on the program today and sharing your experience as, um, you know, someone who has been in this, the Executive Secretary of Lagos State Domestic Sexual and Violence Agency. Thank you so much, Titi Lola. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a lovely day. You too. Have a great day ahead. All right. So, well, that's the much we can take today on the program, uh, the 12th day in the mod, the 12th day in the 16 days of activism. All right. And we had Titi Lola Viva Deni, the Executive Secretary of Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency. So, I mean, she has told us her story, um, you know, the story of how far the agency has come and what she intends to see, you know, better at least by next year when we're talking about the 16 days of activism. And like she said, it's a call for action. So it's on you and it's on me too. So thanks to the producer of the program, Esther Laribe, and the executive producer, Tom Okewale Shonaya. Join us again tomorrow at 12.05 as we bring you another first responder to tell her story. My name is Rose Yusuf Kaiser. Just stay tuned to Women Radio WFM 91.7. Good afternoon. WFM 91.7.